Welcome. Um, let me first introduce the idea of the panel, and then I will introduce the panelists, but rather briefly. Um, we're talking about statistical modeling and causation science. I want to focus on the fact that part of this conference in general is about communication between different fields, between statistics, between the law, between science, between uh, political science, and so on. Different fields, and this was emphasized in the session before lunch, often mean different things by the same words. So one of the things I want to start by focusing on is the word causation. Because depending on where you're from, you may visualize different things. And to communicate properly across um, different fields, we need to understand what the other people are thinking about, what we're, about the words we're saying. We grew up with a little, you know, with a small understanding of the word causation from early, early years. If you pull your little sister's hair and she shrieks, it's because you pulled her hair. Okay. Um, but later on, divisions came in. If you think about the natural sciences, they largely think of causation as creating or requiring or expecting a mechanism that explains how something happened. Newton's law of gravitation <laughs> thought about gravitational forces and how that made apples fall and the, world, the moon circulate the, around the earth and so on. Um, different things, uh, the word causation means different things in different places. For example, in the statistical field, we're going to think about causation partly as how the experiment was designed. Was it an RCT or not? A randomized controlled trial. What are the p-values and all these other um, aspects of causation? Um, before lunch, the, uh, Pro uh, Professor Richardson very eloquently talked about the difference between causation and correlation, which is not well understood. We're talking about causation here. In the legal profession, convincing the judge, the jury beyond a reasonable doubt is similar but not the same. In this session, we are particularly thinking about how people in statistical sciences <clears throat> can contribute to the legal profession and the legal arguments by thinking about bridging some of the ideas from the statistical science into the legal sphere. We have three speakers, and their main and most important characteristic is that they are active in both fields. Um, Maria Cuellar, sitting here, who will speak first, is from the University of Pennsylvania. She works in data science and in criminology. So she is bridging both fields in herself. Okay. We're lucky to have her. S Stephen Lund, who is next, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is a mathematical statistician, but he's working in criminal fields as well. Again, somebody who's bridging the gap that we're hoping to bridge. And Rochelle Trachtenberg at the far end, who will speak third, is from Georgetown. She bridges many fields. Some of them are biostatistics and legal work. So I'm not going to read all their pedigrees, although they have enormous pedigrees. I'm asking you to welcome them as people who already bridge the gap that we're trying to bridge here. Welcome to our three speakers. Thank you, Deb, for that wonderful introduction. Um, let's see, how do I then go into my... Ah, here it is. There we go. Success. Okay. So, I am going to start by teaching you guys some math and then quizzing you at the end. So if you were not present at the beginning of the presentation, you will fail the quiz. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, <clears throat> people will miss out on, on this stuff. 
So I just wanted, I'm going to be telling you about a type of, of causal inference um, study that's called uh, the question of attribution. Uh, but before that, I wanted to introduce a little bit more about what statisticians do. So I wanted to tell you about, um, you know, Deb said that I'm, I'm a statistician and data scientist working in a department of criminology. Uh, and just for the attorneys in the room, so that you know, for academics working at universities, I mean, this might vary depending on your position, but our currency is academic publications in, in academic journals um, and uh, also teaching. So uh, for academic publications, I've been working on a variety of different topics in statistics and the law. I've worked on problems of shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma, uh, contextual bias in forensic science, um, also, I uh, wrote an algorithm for forensic tool mark comparisons that uses machine learning and, uh, you know, and helps do for, uh, firearm and tool mark comparisons in a better way. I'm now working on facial recognition. I love that uh, the previous panel was talking about that as well. Um, and bridging kind of the AI and statistics gap, which is another very interesting uh, gap. And then finally, I work in uncausal inference. <clears throat> I also teach, uh, I teach various courses in the criminology department. One of them is called forensic analysis. And I've already asked some of you if you would be willing to be guest speakers in my, in my uh, semester long course for undergraduates. Um, but this class is about the statistical foundations of forensic science. And a variety of different majors will take the class. Um, and it covers all different kinds of forensic disciplines, but it really focuses on, you know, what are the, the statistical standards that we have and that, that we should have. So statisticians, uh, I think of statisticians are kind of like as being the police of science. Um, Carl Pearson, an early statistician, said it's the, statistics is the grammar of science. But I think of us as kind of like the police. I think of us as being not exactly scientists, although data science is a term that's very popular now, um, but as almost like meta-scientists. Like we are the people coming up with the experimental designs that should be used in the different science disciplines to answer questions. We're the ones kind of looking to see how people have gathered their data and see if they did it correctly. And so we're a little bit like the oversight uh, of the sciences. Um, and what we really value uh, is transparency and careful analysis. So my uh, PhD mentor, who's the reason I got involved with statistics and the law, uh, Steve Feinberg, used to say that um, a careful statistician is the best kind of statistician. Right, and in statistics, we generally need two things. We need an estimate, which is the answer to a question, and a measure of uncertainty. If you give an estimate for who's gonna win the new presidential election, and you say, oh, you know, I think it's gonna be, you know, 60% likely that candidate A is gonna win, I'm not gonna respond to that. I'll just say, <laughs> with what uncertainty, right? What is your margin of error? How much? should I trust the result that you just gave me? And so that is something that statisticians generally need. Uh, I gave a lecture at the law school at Penn some years ago, and I went on and on about error rates and forensic science, and then about half an hour into the lecture, the professor who, was, who I was giving a guest lecture in his class, he said, but why should we care about error rates? Why don't you just tell us the answer about whether the two fingerprints were really made by the same finger? And so I thought, oh, I did. I guess this was obvious to me because that's, that's how it is in statistics. We always talk about you want an answer, but you always have to uh, qualify it by saying how certain are we about this answer. Without that measure of uncertainty, it's almost like you told me, I won't believe anything you say. Um, I need to know, you know, and then there's other stuff I also need to know, like what's the method that you use? How did you get to this measure of uncertainty, et cetera. But those are the two, like, the, the, that's the bread and butter. Um, and finally, I just wanted to say that what we do is we structure unstructured problems. So we listen to what people are doing in the sciences, in medicine, in the law, and we structure what, they're, what they need and uh, formalize it with math. And then we have all kinds of rules and requirements from statistics that help us 
uh, get to the answer and its measure of uncertainty in the proper, proper way. And so I think, I think of statistics as a very creative field that also might lead to not always agreeing, right? Like the field, if you go to a statistics conference, you'll see that there's a lot of arguing and not a lot of agreement uh, about some of the details. But I think at least we, were all, we would all agree like it's important to formalize things and then also provide that measure of uncertainty. Um, so yeah, uh, that I, I love working in statistics and the law and I think um, there's some problems that are underexplored, so I'm gonna be telling you about one of them, um, dealing with, I think will be relevant with the next panel, uh, with uh, sort of like class action lawsuits. So suppose there's an example uh, with dealing with Roundup. So Dwayne Johnson, who is shown here on the right, he was born in 1972, and he worked as a school groundskeeper for two years, in 2012 to 2014, where he was exposed to Roundup which is an herbicide, it's incredibly common in the US. Uh, and then uh, in 2014, he developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. And later he sued Monsanto, the creator of Roundup, for having caused his cancer. And so he wants to prove that his cancer was caused by his exposure to Roundup. And so I'm gonna give you three different statements and I want you to think about what kind of statement uh, Dwayne's attorney should be making. Okay, so the first one is, given that a man is exposed to Roundup, it's likely that he'll develop cancer. The second one is, given that a man developed cancer, it's likely that he was exposed to Roundup. And then the third one is, this man was exposed to Roundup and he developed cancer, and so it's likely that it was the exposure to Roundup and not something else that caused the cancer. These three are called uh, statements of forecasting, backcasting, and attribution. So raise your hand if you think that the attorney should be making a forecasting kind of statement. What about backcasting? And what about attribution? Okay, whoa, that, one, that one's winning. Um, okay, so we really uh, actually, in, in the law, we actually need both forecasting and attribution, and we really also should care about backcasting. So in forecasting, it's the question of um, how carcinogenic is this, this uh, roundup, right? And this will, uh, you know, if it's not carcinogenic, that, that has to do with general causation. And so if it's not carcinogenic, we think it doesn't satisfy general causation, and we did, it's sort of not a, it's a moot point. The, the whole case is not that important. Attribution um, is specific causation, and that has to do with, you know, in this case specifically, can we say that, that we can attribute the, the outcome to the exposure? So there's a way to formalize attribution, and this is not commonly done. Like in uh, epidemiology expert witness reports, they actually really focus on forecasting um, and making an argument for the fact that there was an exposure, but not much at all on attribution. Uh, maybe there's a verbal argument, but not a quantitative argument. So I will give you the, um, the quantitative argument briefly um, and just let you think about it for a minute. So basically, the way that we formalize this by using causal inference is I'm first going to define a few variables. So Y is an, the outcome, one if the person gets cancer, zero if they don't. A is an exposure, it's one if they're exposed to Roundup, zero if they're not. And then there's Y super A, this is called a potential outcome, uh, if we had set the exposure to be either zero or one. And then X is a vector of information about the individual, things like gender, age, et cetera. So if you look at this uh, equation just for a second, I promise that it is not here to confuse you, but it's here to clarify the quantity that I think we should be estimating. So it's called the probability of causation, it's a function of the covariates, the information about the individual. And the way that it's defined is, what's the probability that given that this person has cancer and they were exposed to Roundup, and they have some characteristics, what's the probability that given all the stuff that we do know happened, that if he had not been exposed, he would not have had cancer? This also is discussed as but for causation. So, he wouldn't have had cancer but for the fact that he was exposed to this Roundup, 
right? We think that the Roundup exposure is the thing that caused it. Um, and so this is the quantity that we want to estimate. There's a counterfactual argument in there because we don't know what happened, right? What would have happened had he not been exposed? And so to estimate this, we have to deal with what's called the fundamental problem of causal inference is dealing with the fact that we don't, in this world, we do not observe both what happened when he was exposed and what happened when he's not exposed. And so there's, uh, this is the problem of causal inference. This is what we work with. It's always this way. There's always a counterfactual uh, situation that we cannot directly observe. And so there's a sequence of steps that we go through. The first one is first defining that causal parameter. Then we have to make some assumptions. They're called identification assumptions to get to an observable quantity. And then we have to estimate this quantity. And then we get to a final estimate and confidence interval. That's my final answer with its measure of uncertainty that I've been talking about. And so these are just pretty standard steps. What statistics, machine learning, even AI are working with is basically steps from two to four. Causal inference is an added step, which is formalizing the thing that you want to estimate that has to do with these counterfactual outcomes. And so that's um, something I've worked with uh, on, in my research, um, is estimating this probability of causation. I've done it in different settings. And the hard part is finding really good data to do it. But in general, uh, it can be done if you have data uh, from an exposure and an outcome and some covariates, we can do it. Uh, and you just have to think about the assumptions and whether you, you believe them. And so that was just an example of, you know, here's this question from the law. It's not often discussed in terms of probabilities or, you know, math in general, but we can formalize it. That's what statisticians are really good at, is taking this kind of uh, unexplored question and quantifying it, formalizing it. And then we have all kinds of tools, uh, some very advanced, some very old, that are still very good, um, to obtain you know, the, the valid results, which are an answer and a confidence interval. And so we can sort of do all of that. Um, and so I think that this is a way that statisticians can contribute to legal matters, is not just uh, you know, coming at the end and saying, oh, you know, let me help you decide what these error rates mean, right? But instead, thinking from the beginning, like, what is the thing we should be asking, right? What are the thing? I know that there are all kinds of admissibility standards and rules of evidence, but also just in general, if you just ignore those for a minute, uh, what should we be doing, right? What's the proper thing to do? And so statisticians are just really good at uh, doing that. Um, and so, yeah, there's also, you know, I think the way that we can help is, uh, we can testify as experts. I do this regularly, often with forensic science cases. I'm working on one now in shaken baby syndrome and hair microscopy, uh, talking about like the validity and reliability of these methods, et cetera, just to clarify the ideas to the judge or jury, uh, and jury, I should say. We can you know, write amicus briefs. Um, we can pr participate in organizations that recommend standards that's more of a top-down approach. But it's, it, for example, the um, NIST's OSAC, the uh, organization, uh, OSAC stands, do you, do you remember what it's called? Scientific, Scientific Area Committee? Area. That's right, thank you. I'm a part of OSAC and I always forget. Um, I'm, I'm a yeah, participating um, member of OSAC. And, so, and then also publishing in academic journals. That's what we're paid to do. If you want an expert witness who's a statistician to work for you, right, you have to convince them that you know, you'll pay them all of the stuff that maybe they'll work for you. But uh, think about, like, they want to get, they have to get publications, right? Like, think about what they're trying, to, what are their incentives and what kinds of questions they're interested in. Like, we're really good at kind of like explaining these concepts and being the police of science. And so that's, you know, if you're wondering what on earth do statisticians do, that is what, that's what we do. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And next, to Stephen Lund. Thank you. I'm from NIST. Gonna, you can, okay. I think mine can just be closed. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Joel and the organizing committee for the honor of participating in this panel and uh, AAAS and for everyone in the room for the wonderful conversations that have been taking place during this event. 
Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my NIST colleague, Hari Iyer. Uh, conversations with Hari have really informed the slides we're about to, uh, about to go through. And I should also offer this disclaimer that the viewpoints presented here are our own uh, and not intended to reflect those of anybody else at NIST. Uh, so let's start with a little role-playing example. Suppose you're a forensic lab manager tasked with deciding which of two methods will be used at your lab uh, for conducting bullet comparisons. And so you go and uh, do a validation test. Let's say it's even fairly extensive where you form a thousand pairs of bullets that you know were fired from the same gun and a thousand pairs of bullets that you know uh, were fired from different guns. And you distribute these to your examiners and ask them uh, to uh, analyze these pairs using methods one and two. Uh, and then when you've gathered the results, you start looking back and you find that each of the methods produced 13 false positives and 12 false negatives. So the two methods were exactly identical in this sample of the error rate study. Uh, but in terms of cost, method two was faster, uh, uses uh, less expensive equipment, and involves far less human labor. So on the basis of this information, method two seems pretty compelling. Well, method one is a traditional method of an examiner applying uh, visual inspection using a, a comparison microscope. Uh, and method two is a new technology, uh, spin the wheel of conclusions. <laughs> so wherever it lands, that's the conclusion that you report. Now, I use this extreme example to uh, emphasize the point that for opinion scales with more than two levels, error rates do not provide enough information to assess usefulness. Uh, error rates are a portion of the information that's gathered from validation testing, uh, but there are other details and those details matter. Uh, in particular, we learn the rates not just of how often exclusion happens among mated comparisons or how often identifications happen among different uh, or uh, non-mated comparisons. We actually learn the rates of each conclusion type under each of those two, uh, two scenarios. And it's these details that can be used to distinguish whether an examiner is um, employing comparison mi microscopy or spinning the wheel of uh, conclusions. Uh, but a lot of the attention in the community has focused on error rates in particular. And in fact, this has been a hot topic among the st statistical forensics community as well, with more than a dozen papers being published in the last five years about different ways that error rates should be computed. Uh, but I'd like to take a step back and first consider the question of what role does performance data play? And I think everyone can agree that opinions backed by stronger performance demonstrations are more reliable and should be given more weight. There's that word, weight. Uh, and so what does this mean? Well, in the 1970s, Peter Morris uh, provided a framework under uh, the norms of Bayesian decision making about how somebody should respond to an expert's opinion. And the framework described in those papers um, allows for multiple judges, I mean, sorry, multiple uh, experts, even if they have conflicting perspectives, and the incorporation of performance data. Uh, so I'll dive into this, but gently. Uh, we won't jump into the deep end. So let's just talk about briefly updating belief. If we're talking about belief, there's some measure of uncertainty, so there has to be something we're trying to assess. In this case, let's suppose we're just trying to decide which of two propositions are true. Were these bullets fired from the same gun, or were these bullets fired from two different guns? And uh, at the outset, with whatever information you have uh, to this point in your life, you have some measure of uncertainty. Uh, or characterization of your belief at that point. Could be a 50-50, maybe you have some reason to think that it's more likely that they were fired from the same gun than they were not. Whatever it is, uh, that's characterized by what are referred to as your prior odds. Uh, then, uh, hopefully you're exposed to some new information uh, so that it's not just going by your initial gut feel or whatever it has in the past, but something that pertains to this particular case. So let's suppose that it's an image collected from comparison microscopy, which takes the two bullets in question, uh, starts arranging them so that you can get kind of side-by-side -side, um, images from these to see how well the pattern from one feeds into the next. Uh, so you look at this, and now um, with that new information, maybe you would recharacterize your uncertainty um, regarding the two propositions. So that's kind of your updated belief or what you believe now. Uh, in the formal framework, we refer to this as posterior odds. And the extent to which your beliefs changed upon encountering this new information describes the impact of that new information. Uh, so we might call this like the strength of the, uh, of the evidence, the, the strength that it exerted on your uncertainty. Uh, now, in Bayes' rule, formally, we call that characterization of strength a likelihood ratio. Uh, 
but we want to associate something with a zero effect. Um, uh, sorry, we want uh, a measure of zero to have no influence, but when you're multiplying, multiplying something times zero has a huge effect of making the product zero. Uh, so often this is described on the log scale, where things add instead of multiply, and so you take your log prior odds plus your log likelihood ratio gets to your log uh, posterior odds. And it's this term right in the middle here, here that um, describes the weight. So if it has um, no weight, then your prior odds are just the same as your posterior odds and you weren't influenced. Now, when you're looking at this pattern information, you or I, we don't really have a detailed understanding of where do these patterns come from? How common are they in the, in, out in the environment, right? We don't have a background knowledge to try to make an informed characterization there and that's where we call in an expert to express an opinion. Now, an expert may use their knowledge and what they see in this particular case and arrive at um, their opinion. Maybe they characterize it as an identification conclusion. So now what we have is the information we saw from the pattern plus the expert's conclusion. And now there's a question of what does this expert's conclusion supposed to mean? Now many people just assume like, okay, well the jurors, once they hear that, will kind of defer to the expert's opinion. If they say it's an ID, that means these two things were fired from the same, uh, the same gun. And then if you're gonna give the expert that type of role, you pay a lot of attention to what type of opinion are they expressing. You're like, well maybe they shouldn't say identification because this kind of infringes on the role of the juror to assess the weight of the evidence. So maybe what the uh, expert should do is instead provide the weight that uh, they would associate or the influence of the evidence that they would have when they've looked at these, these patterns given their background knowledge. Or maybe they won't understand the numbers, so maybe we'll do a verbal scale translation of that or whatever other conclusion scale you're going to, to come up with. Well, under the normative framework that um, was described by Morris back in the 70s, regardless of what uh, type of opinion an expert expresses, it is all just considered as new information for the recipient. So they don't take that because the expert said so to me, now this is revealing ground truth to me or telling me what I should think about it. It is simply characterizing somebody else's opinion about this. And with that information, now I am tasked with deciding what weight will I give to that new information? How much weight will I give that expert's opinion? So how do they do that? Well, to do this, we need two quantities. One is a characterization of how likely would the expert have been to provide that opinion if the first proposition were true. And the second is, well, how likely would they have been to pr uh, produce that opinion if the second proposition were true? And the ratio of those two things provides the recipient's likelihood ratio. But now where are we expecting recipients to get their information to assess how likely an expert is to produce a particular result in a particular scenario? Right? It seems a tall order to expect that laypersons will suddenly absorb enough information about the technical details and underlying science to be able just to predict what type of opinions people will um, result uh, in different scenarios. Fortunately, there's another way, and we've already seen it. The validation data goes and shows what type of results were obtained under these different scenarios. And this is very um, useful information when you're trying to guess what type of results would this person say in different scenarios. Uh, but to do this, we don't focus on the error rates um, alone. Instead, uh, we look at the rates of a particular uh, conclusion. So let's say that the expert has provided an identification uh, conclusion using comparison microscopy. We could say, okay, well, how often have you said identification when you were comparing two bullets that were fired from the same gun? Okay, that was 87.3% of the time. How often do you do it when you are firing uh, or comparing bullets fired from different guns? Oh, 1.3. And so then taking the ratio of those two things would give a likelihood ratio of 6.7 or correspondingly a weight on the log scale of four. Now if we go over to our wheel of conclusions, somebody who says, I also arrived at an identifi uh, identification conclusion, uh, but what method did you use? Oh, I used the wheel of conclusions. Okay, well how often do you produce an identification when comparing two bullets that were fired from the same gun? 1.3% of the time. And how often do you produce an identification conclusion when looking at a pair of bullets fired from different guns? 1.3% of the time, because the wheel doesn't really care whether the bullets were fired from the same gun or not. And so in this instance, the rates are the same, the ratio is one, and the weight then on the log scale is zero. So it didn't have any influence on your, uh, your uncertainty. And you can apply this to each of the conclusion levels in turn and find that, thank God, you don't ever give any weight to the wheel of conclusions. Uh, so in this example, uh, the uh, illustrations have been like with a fixed probability, but I would be remiss as a statistician not to mention that there is uncertainty underlying this, and that it's not just the proportions that you've seen, but how much data you have um, indicating those proportions. 
So this plot is intended to show the uh, part that's blocked here. It says uh, study size. So that's like how many validation samples were collected. And the y-axis is showing the uh, fact finder's weight associated uh, with that evidence. So at an initial state, those dots are maybe their pre-existing belief. They don't really know what to expect from an examiner under different scenarios, so they don't give it a whole lot of weight. The likelihood ratios are kind of close to one. But as the expert starts to provide more data uh, about it, you see that the influence um, of their opinion grows because you have a better idea of what to expect from an expert under the different scenarios. Uh, and so one key takeaway from this is reliability is not binary. Everybody in the world wants to start talking to a statistician about how many samples do I need? And that implies that there's some magical threshold afterwards we, talk, we don't have to talk about uncertainty anymore. And it just doesn't work like that. There's a continuum in the background, and so it's more of a cost-benefit analysis that, oh, if we collected more samples, then people's confidence could adjust more strongly. And eventually it kind of tapers out, um, and where it tapers out depends on just how rare of a thing you're looking at. So if you want something to go to one in a million, uh, type of characterization, then you need about three million samples. If you want to be able to say it's one in 10, you only need about 30. Uh, but so there's, there's a continuum underlying, underlying this. Uh, so I will wrap up on uh, yesterday's theme. People were asked about what, uh, what their wish list would be. Mine would be that when an expert provides an opinion, they also provide a spreadsheet that uh, embodies the collection of empirical testing that their method has been subjected to. And so the expectation is that other parties will use that data as the basis for establishing what weight to give the expert's opinion. And so this, if, if um, pr provided in a simple format, could be used by parties from either system uh, or either side of uh, a dispute to characterize, well, how much information does that really say about the case at hand? So if it's a comparison between uh, bullets from pistols, uh, that's in the actual case, you say, okay, maybe there's 153 comparisons involving bullets from pistols and somebody from the other side, but wait, these are Glocks and Glocks are different. They have different reproducibility characteristics than others. Only 10 of these involved Glocks and none were conducted by this examiner. So really how informative is this? And it is this very discussion that educates the stakeholders uh, and brings, starts to bring science into f forensics. It's this di discussion of what empirical support is there behind uh, uh, be behind the data that's, that's uh, available uh, to understand what to expect from an expert in cases like the one at hand. Uh, so I will leave with these uh, final two quotes. Uh, Richard Feynman, uh, Nobel laureate, has characterized science as the organized skepticism in the reliability of expert opinion, uh, or uh, very succinctly summarized by Edward Deming, who was famous for bringing quality control to Japanese manufacturing. Uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. Thank you. Next, Rochelle Trachtenberg. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks to Maria and Steve for those um, super informative for a statistician uh, presentation. So for the rest of you, no more math, I promise. So we're gonna talk about something that I have found uh, spectacularly useful in combining disparate sources of evidence. Um, and in this case, we're going to be talking about data-based evidence. But whenever you have a result like, uh, like Steve was talking about, there may be data behind it. And um, I think that the Tolman diagram uh, may be something that's useful to people when, if they're going to be hot tubbing, don't take your laptop, but maybe think about Tolman diagrams. And also, if um, the Texas model for getting all the, all the evidence together and the prosecution and defense can see the evidence and in your Daubert uh, considerations, you would be able to make a determination of the relevance of, of the evidence or the data-based evidence um, on the basis of whether or not it supports an argument. So it turns out that Tolman was, so I uh, just, I should pre preface these slides by uh, noting that they are busy with text and so they will be useful to you if you ever want to go back and look at them. So I always post annotated versions of my slides at Trachtenberg, uh, it's academia.edu and if you just search on my last name, you'll be able to find these slides, they'll be annotated and then you can go back and read all this nonsense. But um, the, this is the basic structure of the argument. You have some data, 
which is any kind of information, doesn't have to be actually electronic data, and you want to make the claim based on the data. So we'll see the Roundup example and a ballistics example in a moment, but you just want to claim that um, Roundup caused this cancer, and the basis for that claim is the data that you've assembled. The reason why you believe the data support the claim is contained in the backing and the warrant. So there's some scientific evidence supporting why these data are relevant and the warrant for you bringing them, particularly in this case, to match to the claim. But importantly, there's this rebuttal side of the argument. So for example, if Steve says, well, gun one fired both uh, bullets one and two, then he has his scientific and data backing and the warrant for that claim. The other side would be able to see that argument and that, those data and say something like, wait, Glocks don't follow that. So the rebuttal side gives an alternative and it is also backed up by data. So the Tolman structure can be really handy for putting all your, uh, all of the evidence together around one claim. So this isn't for all the evidence in the entire trial, but just if there's one uh, particular type of evidence, so a ballistics report or hair matching or bite marks or whatever, you'd be able to say, I believe this hair came from this person, here's my backing and warrant, and somebody else's rebuttal could be that hair could have come from any other person, and here is the evidence, uh, the science behind my rebuttal to your claim. So with the Tolman diagram, once you've mapped your information into it, you can then explore the um, verifiability or in the literal technical uh, sense, as was uh, mentioned earlier, validity and reliability are technical terms uh, in, from the measurement literature. So you can look at the validity and reliability. This is the Roundup example. So as far as can be known, the individual, the data are, this person uh, did not have cancer prior to that, as far as can be known, that's 100% true, and this person was in fact exposed to Roundup. So the data are correct. The backing for the warrant that these data support the claim Roundup caused this person's cancer is that when you look at Roundup, if you turn around, look at the label, it has known human carcinogens. So when humans are exposed to this carcinogen, um, then cancer will, it's, uh, it's uh, carcinogenic. Then you have the warrant, when humans are exposed to carcinogens, they will develop cancer some percent of the time. So that's an epidemiologic uh, argument, and it's not 100% true, but it is well documented across multiple uh, types of literature. So you have animal models of uh, uh, carcinogen reactivity and a bunch of epidemiologic models and longitudinal studies. So there's a variety of triangulation going on in the evidence in this blue box. So your path from data to claim in this Tolman diagram is, is pretty well supported. And once all the data have been mapped into this framework, the um, uh, judge can determine whether or not the rebuttal and the alternative explanation for the relationship between the data and the claim or the observation of the data and the claim are worth admitting. So at this point, the judge can ask specific questions of both sides. How well documented is this? What is your error rate? Is it based on the data that you have provided? Would two experts agree? So with a Tolman diagram, you can uh, direct the Dobert questioning, I guess, in a structured way. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is the ballistics example with the same mapping. So, again, we don't have to go over that, but, um, okay. So, one idea that I have, we, in our pre-game meeting, we were talking about um, what could uh, law, what could juries or judges or lawyers do with this information. So this is just a list of questions that a judge might ask either of the data that were presented or the evidence that was presented or they can ask the two presenting sides to reconcile before making their decision about. So then the judge is not required to weigh the evidence and be 
be or become an expert in this field, they ask the experts to answer these questions and address all the elements of the Tolman diagram. Or when you have data like this that are admitted, then or evidence like this that's admitted, you can have your um, jury ask questions like these. So if you are going to let the jury decide whether or not the evidence are or are not compelling, you can ask them questions using the same framework. I think that's all I have. Thank you very, very much. And next, we should move to questions. And I want to um, emphasize the people from Texas in the, in the very good presentation this morning talked about how lawyers should interact with, with the um, scientists, ask questions. This is um, Ms. Garcia. I'm asking you a question. <laughs> um, Please let us know what was clear, what was not, what we would like to know. So questions, please. Uh, first question, and then we'll go to that side. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lund, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, in your ideal model, uh, what you basically have is you have a prior probability very close to one, very soft uh, in the setting. You then have an evaluation of the evidential force of some kind of evidence, and then you get your posterior probability, and that's very neat. What happens, or how do you account for the possibility that the judgment of evidential force uh, will be based uh, on prior knowledge that should not figure in it, and that that knowledge will be different than the knowledge in a validation study? So, to be specific, let's take your example of a subjective bullet comparison. Uh, if the person is engaged in a, a validation study, and certainly if they know that it's a validation study, um, they will say, you know, this could be uh, dummy or it could be true. If they're engaged in actual field work, however, they may begin with the idea, you know, I wouldn't have this unless the police had some reason for thinking that the bullet they gave me matched the bullet fired from this particular gun. And then when they are trying to evaluate the evidential force, uh, that may actually psychologically affect the judgment they give. I mean, it's quite extreme and we sort of know how to deal with it when the police say we think we've got the man. But there's a lot of other subtle cues uh, that people can have uh, which can affect their weight estimate, um, how does one deal with that? Yeah, it, that's an excellent question. And so um, I will uh, translate that into statistical, um, how I process that. And the concern about if you have other con contextual information that kind of leaks into your assessment of, say, like the pattern evidence, and in that case, I think we're talking about the expert is learning something else about the case or who brought, the, brought it to them. Uh, eventually that becomes that you think that the distribution reflecting the expert's behavior in casework is not well represented by the expert's behavior in the validation data. And so if that were your uh, belief, then the validation data would offer little to reduce your uncertainty about what to expect under the um, application in, in uh, casework. And so uh, science doesn't have the answer to that directly. If what you have is um, data collected under one scenario and then usage under a different scenario, there's just a subjective interpretation about, oh, I expect that there will be a shift here or I expect that there won't be really a shift here. Uh, and it's data like what's being collected out of Houston where they're inserting the blind uh, proficiency testing that probably narrows the um, room for that subjective interpretation, right? So some will find the, the existing literature that was not conducted on blind testing to be compelling. And others will say, oh, no, 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 they could be changing their responses knowing that this is participating in uh, invalidation experimentation. And uh, we don't have an authoritative answer about did they change their behavior or not. We need, to, if you're going to try to answer that question, right, that's another round of testing of experiments designed to check exactly for that. Could I just comment on that too? Um, so the fact that uh, 
a lot of these disciplines are still subjective, right? That they are, these comparisons are being done by, the, the key decisions in the comparison is done by a human. Um, and you cannot really, it's a black box, right? You can ask the human a bunch of things, but really what's going on in their mind, you cannot really explore uh, in depth, right? And so uh, it can always be that they're gonna make decisions in a way that is, biased either by contextual information or some th prior belief they, or they woke up that morning and they were feeling crappy, right? Um, and that's why I think there's a push to move towards uh, de at least developing objective methods, um, algorithms that are developed based on data and are transparent and can be uh, explored to see how it was that the determination uh, was made. And so I think that's what that's all about. It's kind of opening the black box and saying like, how did we get to that conclusion? And was there some bias there? Because there's probably gonna be bias coming all over the place, right? From the, from the police, from, who, there are a lot of incentives, but at least that comparison we could isolate and make objective. So. A question from the other side. Thank you. Um, I have a question about likelihood ratios and a communication about that to a jury. So um, we're living in a world where these, no well, the evidence usually is that the numbers are quite large, in the billions and the trillions of likelihood ratios. And we're living in a world where the words billion and trillion are being thrown around very often. We have our first trillionaire in America, billion dollar budgets. And so normal juries are desensitized to how large those numbers actually are. So when I relate to a jury um, a billion times more likely, I ha my analogy that I use is in time. A billion seconds is approximately 31.5 years, just to make it more relatable to the jury. And I was just wondering if any of you have any other suggestions about other analogies that can make likelihood ratios more relatable to the layperson. So I like that illustration in terms of trying to just conceptualize magnitude of a number. Uh, and I don't really have a suggestion for something that would be more relatable uh, than that off the top of my head. Uh, but it does raise another point about jury understanding, which wasn't touched on, right? So there's a strong um, tendency among people that haven't really thought about Bayes' equation to think that a likelihood ratio is posterior odds, that it wraps up all the considerations that are needed and is kind of a, giving you an ultimate determination or characterization. Uh, and that's something that's very, very difficult, uh, I think, to, to overcome when communicating to a non-statistical audience. So I don't, I don't have a suggestion of a better... I, I, just I a, mean, you're right that having numbers that make sense to people in their terms in something that they can visualize is super important. Yeah. Um, and billions and trillions are, mean different things in different countries in the world. <laughs> Add just to the a, confusion. Just a qu really quick thing. So um, out of Europe, uh, there's an EnFSI e report where they're trying to sort of standardize the way that people talk about likelihood ratios and they have a table that I teach my students where they have a number and then the equivalent phrase that they recommend should be used. And so I don't know how help helpful it really is. I, I like your idea better of like concept, like what is this number? Um, but they do say like this value equates to it seems extremely likely or whatever. Yes. They have a phrase. So, I mean, I don't have them memorized, but you could uh, take a look or if you like, we can exchange emails later and I can send it to you. Thank you. Yeah. Can we have one more question? Okay, one more question. Thank you for all these are great presentations. I teach uh, evidence to law students and get, I've had to excise basic statistical and Bayesian reasoning from my course because of the amount of pushback I get. So I have a question to all of you as, as experts, but also as educators. Um, one of the things I find difficult to overcome in translating types of reasoning that you've talked about here today to folks who are, who, who are not trained in it and will probably not become trained in it is not just the, the translation of numbers, but the thinking in uncertainty. And like, of course, law students are starting to think in uncertain, become comfortable being that the world is uncertain, inherently uncertain, but just the concepts of uncertainty overcoming the kind of innate heuristics and biases we have to simplify things like causation. Tips, how we can even just get to that step one of the idea, the concepts of uncertainty that underlie all of this. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you very, very much. So, and yes, one group that's thought about uncertainty a lot is the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. They have done a lot of thinking. You want to? Yeah. yeah, so one thing I was struck by was reading the federal rules for evidence, and the term probability or more probable comes up a lot. 
One of the, so I teach, when I teach statistics, it's to medical students or practitioners who are incredibly resistant um, to the idea that may, they may not know everything. So um, you, you can normalize the language because they are all really good at language-based things and pointing out that you're talking about probability and like Steve's argument uh, and actually Maria's as well, it's totally quantitatively based but the result is a shift in your understanding of how likely is this evidence to support whatever the claim is. So if you use the language that they're already learning about probable cause or, I mean, they use probability a lot, I was surprised, um, then it links, Gesundheit, it links the, um, what they're learning to how they're going to be using it in a way that maybe makes the numbers less intimidating to get past. I, I'll add one really quick thing. So I think uh, for my students, I teach criminology and a bunch of other disciplines, people who take my forensic science class, my statistics class. I think that um, more recently, statistics and data science with this like added term of data science has become more popular. It used to be statistics was kind of this like boring, stuffy thing. And now data science is a very shiny new toy and everyone wants to learn it. Um, so I think using, sort of kind of using that, um, I've, uh, I teach this stuff to the students as this like new methodology, new disciplines. And, uh, and some of it I teach them in coding. Like I teach them to code it up in R and then show them, you know, now you can do it too. So I think seeing it as like a shiny new thing is helpful, but also um, the fact that I was trying to do that, but it's just not a lot of time, but that some of these statistical arguments actually clarify the point instead of obscuring it. And so I think if we had a little more time, like that base rule, argument, it really is telling you like th this is the way that we can do the reasoning and it's in like three different parts and you can just see it right there. It's like the formalization clarifies what is happening or at least what should happen. And so I teach it to my students as a way of like don't really, I don't care that much if you like get a hundred in your math test or whatever, but let me just explain this argument to you with these in this formulation and you'll see that you can actually understand it too and it's actually clearer. And that kind of makes them feel very empowered that they understand this argument, and then I'm like, well, you can do it too, you know? I think, so I think that um, is what I've done with my students, and they end up saying, like, I didn't know I could do statistics, but now this is, you know, now I can do it. And it's just a lot better than if I didn't have that tool to express um, uncertainty. Panel, thank you very, very much, and audience, thank you very, very much.